Welcome everyone. My name is Jan Berner. I'm going to be moderating the session. I'm one of the two speakers of the transdisciplinary research area, innovation technology for sustainable futures. And I'm very glad to welcome our speaker for today. Uh, Susan Stele Donner has agreed to give uh, the lecture today. Uh, she graduated and did her PhD in hydrology at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and currently holds a professorship at the Department of Geoscience and Remote Sensing at Delft University of Technology. And at Delft, she leads the M-Wave, uh, standing for Microwaves for Water and Vegetation group. And her group uses microwave remote sensing to study land atmosphere interactions, and in particular, the role of vegetation in water, energy, and carbon cycles, which is something that interests us quite a bit um, for uh, many years already. Uh, Susan also leads the Minerva, a network of Dutch academic and industry partners focused on using microwave remote sensing of vegetation for agriculture and food security, also two topics that interest us a lot. And she's a member of the mission advisory group for the ESA's Rose L mission. And in her lecture today, she will offer us a look into vegetation with microwaves and uh, then also discuss implications for agricultural and ecological monitoring. Susan, thanks so much for making time um, and for erroneously meeting us uh, in the room yesterday. I logged in a, an hour early, but now everything worked out and you are here and uh, the audience is there. So floor is yours. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Um, thank you very much for the introduction um, and also the invitation to present our uh, research here today. Um, I want to start my presentation um, by thanking my research group. So you will see that in the following slides, uh, most of the figures and a lot of the work is done by uh, my PhD students, master's students and uh, postdocs. And so I want to thank them up front for all of their uh, contributions to the talk. Um, yeah, I was, um, when I was invited to give the presentation, I thought, well, that's a very, very broad topic. So where do I start? Um, and what I also realized was it's a very broad group. And so what I plan to do in the, the next half hour is to give a bit of an overview into um, microwaves. So for people who aren't familiar with microwave remote sensing, um, to give a, a short introduction on what they are and why they're useful. Um, and then I want to show you some examples of how we use radar specifically for vegetation monitoring. So I'll do that for uh, the Amazon area with uh, ASCAT data and also some of our recent research with uh, Sentinel-1, um, which is a SAR satellite and also with uh, some ground-based uh, experimental campaigns. Um, and what I realized, the kind of story I want to tell you today is our approach to uh, using microwaves to monitor vegetation. Um, and I think we have three core ideas. The first one is that we, um, we try to produce actionable information. And so it's not so much about taking uh, microwave remote sensing and retrieving a single variable like soil moisture or uh, leaf area index and then improving that retrieval. But it's really about asking users what information they need for a certain application and then looking at radar signatures to see how we can extract that. So how can we um, take what we observe with satellites and use that to produce information that people can really uh, work with and take actions with. Um, the second thing that we do a lot of, because we enjoy it, is um, physical interpretation. And this becomes really necessary because we're able to observe things that we could never observe before. And we're able to observe with a resolution that we couldn't do before. Um, and this means that some of the models that we use and some of the assumptions that we make, that we're, we're constantly questioning those. Um, and so a lot of our research is really around the physical interpretation of uh, microwave data. And in our group, it's particularly on uh, radar. Um, and where I want to go in the end is hopefully uh, this is a, a group of new users. Um, one of the reasons um, why the uptake of um, SAR remote sensing and microwave remote sensing for vegetation can be a little slow is that the data is perceived as being less accessible. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was try to make it a bit more accessible so that we can really have uh, a dialogue with uh, new users um, so that they can tell us what they need and that we can work together to figure out how we can do that with uh, microwaves. So I'm going to start there with um, what exactly are microwaves. Um, for measuring the land surface. So this is an overview of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can see uh, this very tiny part of the spectrum. So this is visible light. 
Um, and microwaves, uh, it's quite a, yeah, it's a relatively large part of the spectrum, but the, the part that we use for observing the land surface is generally between one and 10 gigahertz. So one by 10 to the nine gigahertz. Um, and in terms of wavelength, it means a wavelength of between maybe three centimeters and 30 centimeters. Um, so for measuring the land surface, we, I think most people have seen imagery from visible light. So when you get lost and you use Google Maps and you look at satellite imagery, these are all in the visible light part of the spectrum. When we measure temperature, we're moving up here through infrared and then microwaves are up here. And the limitation for using uh, longer wavelengths is that somehow we have to get these things into space. Um, and so at the moment, uh, probably one of the, uh, the biggest kind of antennas we have at the moment is for the SMAP mission. So the, the challenge is that as we go to longer and longer wavelengths, we need bigger antennas and it becomes a, a technology problem. Um, I'll show you some uh, other reasons. So if we look at the spectrum again, so here we can see um, a variation from nanometers to 100 meters. And the microwave parts of the spectrum is here. So this is uh, the attenuation of the atmosphere. So from X, L to X band, so one gigahertz to 10 gigahertz, this is where our microwave observations for the surface uh, are from. And so the attenuation is zero. This means that we can always see through the atmosphere. It doesn't matter if it's cloudy, it doesn't matter if it's raining, we always have observations. You can see that there are frequencies or wavelengths that are used for precipitation and atmospheric water content. These tend to be higher. So X and K band, you can see that the, um, there is some attenuation from water. But this is the part that we use generally for soil moisture and for vegetation monitoring. Um, this is, not, this is not something that we can take for granted. So just as an example, um, this picture here, this is the Netherlands, which we've drawn in in red because otherwise you wouldn't see it. Um, and it's done with this images of two from two different missions. So in the background, you can see a, a red, green, blue com composite from Sentinel-2. And this is what the Netherlands looks like 80% of the time. So basically you just look at cloud. And it's very seldom. So if we look at weather data, it's a, I think uh, there was a study that showed that it's only about 20% of days you would actually get a clear image of uh, the surface in the Netherlands. Um, and so one of the primary reasons why people often think to use microwaves is that we always see through the atmosphere. And so when we, if we have farmers waiting on information, um, it's not really good enough if we're just hoping that it's a clear day. And so the reliability that's provided by Sentinel-1 is really critical for a lot of uh, for monitoring applications. So this is the commonly cited uh, big advantage of microwave, and it's often why people first start to think about microwaves, especially for vegetation. Um, and so it's the fact that we have data whenever we need it. For me, I think the more interesting uh, advantage of microwaves is that when we're using optical data or we're using thermal data, we're sensing the surface or the skin of the, of the surface. So if we were measuring the temperature of this canopy, we'd be looking at the temperature of the top of the canopy. Um, and when we measure reflectance or we measure NDVI, it's the, the top of this canopy. And microwaves really penetrate materials. And so they have a longer wavelength and they really look into the materials and measure a property. Um, and so I just said, so this is true for uh, visible wavelengths and it's also true for the, the shorter wavelengths. So when we use microwaves with a three centimeter wavelength, we penetrate, but we see the top of the canopy. And when we use longer wavelengths, so maybe a meter or 30 centimeters, we start to see the soil and we start to sense the soil. And as the wavelength increases, we see deeper into the soil. Um, and we measure a property. So we're not sensitive to uh, just what's reflected, but we're really measuring a property of the material. Um, and these wavelengths also determine the constituents that we interact with. So when we work with very short wavelengths, we interact with the smaller constituents, so the leaves. When we use longer wavelengths, we tend to interact more with the branches and the trunks. So we start to really penetrate into materials and really interact with the materials. And this property that we measure um, is called the dielectric constant. And it's basically a property of how a material behaves in an electric field. And this is at the core of uh, being able to use microwaves for soil moisture and vegetation. So on the left, you can see these are some molecules that are floating around. Here, if we have an electric field, you can see that the charges are all aligned to oppose that field. So the dielectric constant is a measure of how the molecules in the material can are free to rotate to oppose an electric field. 
Um, and so this is an example of how the dielectric constant of soil varies as a function of soil moisture. So when the soil is quite wet, all of these molecules are very free. So they're in free water and they can rotate very easily. So the dielectric constant is very high. When the water content is very low, then the only water that's in the soil is really bound onto the soil particles and they can't rotate so easily. So the dielectric constant is very low. Um, and so this means that when we have a high dielectric constant, we have a very high uh, backscatter from the soil, for example. And so that means that we have a big difference in how soil moisture looks when it's wet and dry. You can see too, oops, you can see too here that we have um, two parts. So we have a real and an imaginary part. Um, the real part is the one that we mainly use to look at how much is going to be uh, scattered or reflected from the surface. And this, uh, the imaginary part is, uh, it's part of the calculation for how deep we penetrate or how much of a, a material that we sense. So it's worth noting that this is a, it's a complex quantity. And generally when people talk about the dielectric constant, often they refer just to the real part. So similarly to soil moisture, we also have the same in vegetation. And in vegetation, it's a difference between um, when we have very healthy green leaves our dielectric constant is very high. So again, we have very free uh, water. And it's only when the plants start to really, really dry out that we start to have, uh, that the effect of this bound water becomes very important. This happens at relatively low um, vegetation water contents. So the whole reason this works is really that microwaves are very sensitive to water content. And that's what allows us to sense uh, soil moisture and vegetation water content. So that's one thing. The other thing is that we have two kinds of instruments. And so the first one is that uh, we just collect radiation that's emitted. And so you and I are both emitting microwaves. Uh, the soil outside is emitting microwaves. And if we look at a vegetated surface, we have uh, um, microwave radiation that's emitted from the surface itself. We have radiation that's emitted from the vegetation and we have radiation that's emitted from the vegetation and reflected by the soil. And this means that when we collect this radiation, so this is, uh, we discussed, yeah, when we work with this, we work with a brightness temperature. Um, it's a contribution of these three things. And so part of it is from the soil and part of it is from the vegetation. The other way, the other thing that we can do with microwaves is actually transmit a signal. So if we are collecting this um, radiation, it's very low energy. So it has a long wavelength, which means it has a, a low quantum energy. And we have, a, we have to collect over a very large area um, to have sensitivity. And so the resolution of uh, measurements from passive microwaves tends to be very coarse. So it can be higher than tens of kilometers usually. Um, and we can control that. So if we want higher resolution data, we can transmit a signal. And that's what radar and active uh, microwave remote sensing is about. So we transmit uh, a signal and then we measure what comes back to the sensor. And when we do that, we have lots of different types of interactions. So we have direct returns from the soil, direct returns from the vegetation. And then we have these terms that are uh, either uh, they reach the vegetation and then interact with the soil or vice versa. And so we have different scattering mechanisms and they all contribute to the return signal. Um, the figure I'm showing you here is actually how, from a microwave remote sensing perspective, we tend to conceptualize vegetation. So we consider it as a dielectric medium. Um, when we model it, we assume that it's uniform and homogeneous and that the vegetation can be represented by disks and cylinders and that they have a certain dielectric uh, constant. And so this is very much a remote sensing perspective on uh, vegetation. Um, so that was, that's basically a, a short crash course in uh, microwave remote sensing. Um, and what I, I think one of the things that's really important to note is that in the last couple of years, there's a huge diversity in the different kinds of sensors that we have available. And so we have some instruments that have been around for a long time. So AMSR and AMSR2, ASCAT, and then that built on the ERS satellites. And we have uh, SMAP and SMOS, so and we have, lots of different uh, instruments that are in space and they measure at different um, frequencies or wavelengths and they're different types of sensors. So some of them are radars, some of them are uh, active and passive. So we have different instruments. Um, in terms of radar, we have scatterometry is also of course, but we have SAR instruments. And so this is a very diverse range of instruments that are providing data. Um, I hope that I've convinced you somehow that when we have different wavelengths, 
we get different information and we have different sensing depths. And so one of the things is that if we were to put all of these instruments together, we actually have a really incredible view on the land surface. So we're able to look at different constituents. We know that they vary, they have different uh, dynamics. Um, so if we observe the leaves, we know that they change very quickly. If we're observing soil at different depths, we know that the uh, memory has different uh, lengths. And so we're able to observe all of this with, uh, with these different sensors. And so if we can combine them, then we have a very complete view of the, the land surface. And so there are lots of possibilities um, with any of these instruments individually, and certainly if we start to combine them. So I want to show you just some examples of uh, research we've been doing to really use uh, radar for vegetation monitoring. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been doing quite a bit of research with ASCAT. So this is the advanced scatterometer. It's on the MEDOP series of satellites. Um, and this is a useful series because it's been in space for a long time and it's going to be in space for a long time. So if we can measure vegetation, it means we could do it for um, 30 years, uh, at least 30 years. And so we can have a very long term perspective on the role of vegetation in the climate system. Um, ASCAD is quite special in that it has uh, two sets of uh, three antennas. So when they when ASCAD passes over the surface, it measures any point in quick succession at three different incidence angles. And if we combine uh, data as the satellite moves, if we collect data over a, a long period of time, um, we can get some insight into how the backscatter varies with incidence angle. And in general, we assume that if we have an increase in backscatter at a single incidence angle, that's primarily due to a soil moisture change. And if we see that we have uh, a vegetation change, then we expect that the difference is higher. So it leads to a rotation in this uh, curve. So the effect of vegetation water content would be uh, larger at higher incidence angles. Um, ASCAD has been used for a long time to estimate soil moisture. Um, and the way that they accounted for the effect of vegetation was to, uh, first of all, to have a sort of empirical seasonal cycle, then to estimate the seasonal cycle from a, a long data record. And our research is using a new approach where they um, kind of estimate how much this curve is changing over time. And so we describe it as a second order polynomial. So it has, uh, we use the backscatter at some reference angle. And then we use the slope of this uh, curve and the curvature, so the second derivative. And we treat those as the dynamic vegetation parameters because they describe how this rotates in time. And that's basically due to changes in the vegetation phenology. Um, we've done this in grasslands. And recently, we've uh, published a study where we looked at the Amazon and the surrounding areas. And what we're able to show, and I, I can't go into all of the ecosystems here, but um, if we look at the very uh, the tropical rainforests that are generally very stable, we see that the backscatter, it doesn't change a huge amount, but it changes in accordance with the moisture availability. So you see the seasonal cycle in uh, water availability in the backscatter. If we look at the slope and curvature, so these two descriptors of the vegetation, um, what we see is actually the um, effect of radiation on the phenology. So we see this in the slope and the curvature. And so it's less, I mean, there's plenty of water available, but we see the change in the seasonal cycle due to the availability of radiation. So radiation is what's limiting uh, photosynthesis in this area. We also see very tiny uh, differences in um, uh, between the 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. overpass, and that's influenced by moisture demand and availability. So we see this even in the tropical forest areas. Um, one of the things that we wanted to know was if we were able to see any effect of the droughts. So we looked at 10 years of ASCAT data and in that time there were two really big droughts. The first one is in 2010 and you can see that it's really concentrated in the south of our study domain. Um, and here you can see a contrast in the top row. So this is backscatter. The area between the two blue lines is the kind of peak of the drought. This is backscatter slope in the middle and curvature. You see that there isn't a huge difference in terms of uh, any of these variables in the tropical forest. And so even um, this, the sensitivity to sea bands, the, because the forest is just so dense and so wet, it had a very limited effect on the signal. But if we look at the Cerrado, and within the Cerrado, we have different cover types. So we have croplands, we have shrub areas, and we have uh, herbaceous cover. You see that there's a huge, like there's a very substantial anomaly in the backscatter itself. And then also we see a difference in the um, slope and curvature. And here we were kind of surprised. So we didn't expect to see a positive 
anomaly in the slope. So normally we would associate this with an increase in the vegetation volume, but this is actually consistent what they found in uh, VOD. And that's the fact that the, as part of the drought, there was enhanced radiation and this led to an increase in uh, growth and also an increase in VOD. And so what we saw was actually consistent with what happened in, uh, or what was observed with other studies. And we see this to a larger degree in the 2015 drought. So this one was more extensive. We even see anomalies in the, the very dense uh, rainforest, and we see huge variations in the Cerrado areas. Okay, so this is one of these very coarse instruments, and we use that for uh, large-scale monitoring and ecosystem monitoring. And quite a lot of our research is focused on using SAR for vegetation monitoring. And so this is, um, it's different in the sense that the resolution is much finer. Um, and the availability of this kind of data is really something very new. So until Sentinel-1 launched, um, probably the best uh, SAR data for agricultural purposes was the uh, radar sat data from Canada. And the difficulty was really just the revisit time. So the observations were available every 24 days or so. To me, it's very useful for classification, but it's very hard to do real-time monitoring. Um, and Sentinel-1 is an ESA mission. It's part of the um, Copernicus program, and the resolution is much finer. So it's on the order of five by 20 meters. Um, and in the Netherlands, we're actually at a point where we're, lots of the paths overlap. So we have data almost every day, um, but this gives us very high resolution radar data. We can use that for agricultural applications. So what I want to show you is I'm gonna take this as an example to illustrate what we mean by actionable information. So a couple of years ago, we did a study where we, um, we engaged with um, a lot of students from um, uh, a college where they worked on agriculture and entrepreneurship and agriculture. And so these are the kind of next generation of Dutch farmers. And we wanted to work with them to uh, show them what you could do with remote sensing and with radar. So they helped us with uh, collecting a lot of the photographs you can see in these slides. Um, and we processed uh, the Sentinel-1 data um, for this area, which is called Flevoland. It's part of the Netherlands and it's, uh, it's a very productive area. What I'm showing you here is, um, this is a time series of sugar beet data. And so here we have, this is, uh, we transmit a vertically polarized signal, measure uh, the vertically polarized return. Here we transmit vertical, and measure the horizontal return. And this is a ratio of the two of them. So the idea of this uh, cross ratio is that we mitigate the effect of soil moisture. So VV is generally uh, more sensitive to soil moisture. So by normalizing it theoretically here, we should have more of a, uh, a view on the vegetation. So what we find is that um, generally, you can see here that we have an increase in uh, May. This is the planting is around here somewhere. And then we have an increase in uh, May. This is when the biomass is very high. And then you see that there's a lot of uh, variability here. This is when uh, people start to harvest the fields. What I should explain is the individual colors here are individual parcels. The black line is the average of all of the sugar beet fields and the gray line is a, a standard deviation. So it's an indication of the variability across Flavoland. Um, one of the things that we wanted to know was could we detect the emergence? And so when do these leaves first start to pop out of the ground? So it's very difficult to detect a planting date but we hypothesized that we'd be able to see when the uh, emergence happened. And so we basically fit a curve and detected when the, uh, the cross pole started to increase. And when we compared this to our validation data, we do pretty well. Um, and we had a question from a user. So one of the, there's a, a company that are involved in sugar beet production and processing in the Netherlands. And they have a very nice model for predicting yield. And they wanted to know, can you see the date where the, um, the, the leaves of sugar beets in adjacent rows touch. This seems like a very strange thing to measure, but this is the day when the sugar beets start to uh, concentrate on producing sugar beets. And so it's a very good predictor for yield. Um, and so we did this too. So we were able to predict that quite reliably and we were able to map it across Flavoland. Um, we also did the same with using coherence. So using the interferometric coherence, we were able to observe when the sugar beets were harvested and we were able to show them that this was very consistent with what their field agents measured in the field. Um, so a lot of times we have, you know, fairly clear cut applications and information that we're looking for. Um, but because we're observing at a resolution that we're, um, we haven't been able to observe before, it means that a lot of the assumptions we make, we have to question. And also we have observations at different times. 
We want to know what the impact that is. So a lot of our research is really focused on the physical interpretation of these data. Um, and I want to give you an example that we're working on a lot at the moment. And it's related to the presence of surface canopy water. So either from uh, dew formation or from uh, the interception of rainfall or irrigation. Um, and this matters because um, satellites pass by once a day or twice a day. And generally um, SMAP, for example, is at 6 a.m. ASCAD is at 10 a.m. And we want to know what impact that has on the data that we are using for retrievals. Um, if we choose to measure, uh, if we choose to use the 6 a.m. data rather than the 6 p.m. data, what impact does that have? Um, so that's one part of it. And then the other reason is that um, there's an increasing interest in sub-daily SAR. And so there are um, private companies that have constellations of SAR satellites. And so there's a possibility of being able to have multiple SAR images per day. And if we want to use that, we need to understand the effect that this water is going to have on our retrievals. So we installed, these are Decagon uh, leaf wetness sensors. This is a field experiment in Florida. And what we found was that it's basically, in the morning, there is always water on the canopy. So out of 50 days, um, at 6 a.m., there was almost always some water. And what you can see is this dew accumulating during the night. And then as soon as the sun comes up, you see this dissipation. So the droplets form and fall off, and then you also have evaporation. So you see a very rapid um, decrease in the um, surface canopy water. You can see that we have uh, non-zero amounts in the afternoon and also in the evening. And these are from the precipitation events. So these dark days here are uh, storm events that extended throughout the day. But in general, we have a sort of preferential daily cycle where we always have water on the canopy from, uh, from the presence of dew in the morning. If we look at a sort of average backscatter uh, time series over the day, so this is from a ground-based L-band uh, radar. You see, we actually observe this dew accumulation during the night. And then we see a decrease in the morning. So we see this continues through the day, and I'll discuss that in a minute. But we see this drop in the morning, and this is primarily due to the um, dissipation of the dew. And if we look at the amounts involved, uh, these are non-negligible. So this is on the order, if it's like one or two dB, um, that's quite significant because the range over the seasonal cycle is maybe six decibels. And so it's quite, yeah, it's non-negligible. So we wanted to know what the impact of this was going to be on retrieval. I'm showing you some of the results here. So this is um, the cross ratio. So this is the VV over VH again. Um, and so this is a kind of good indicator of biomass in general. And then this one is radar vegetation index. So this is an index that's calculated from quad pole. So using um, the, if you have quad pole radar using all four uh, polarizations. And these are often used for vegetation monitoring because they're very sensitive to um, leafy biomass. So really sensing the volume. Um, we generally see that the, any of these relationships, so this is a RVI versus dry biomass, uh, vegetation water content, plant height and leaf area index. In the season when the plant is really developing and growing, so before it reaches full biomass, everything is increasing monotonically. And so there's a really clear relationship. Once you reach, uh, these are the growth stage 55, um, the plant growth is slowed down, so it's going into the reproductive stages. Um, and what you see is that there's an awful lot of variability. So the canopy is relatively stable, but there's a lot of variation just from water and from structural changes. And so all of our, when we have an empirical relationship, it generally works quite well during this growth period, which is usually the, the time that we're most interested in. And in this period, sorry, my mouse is overheated. Um, you can see that our, our backscatter values are always higher. So because we have dew or we have uh, water on the canopy, the backscatter is higher. Our cross ratio is still higher. The radar vegetation index is also higher. And so we have a different relationship. And so just the presence of this water means that we have uh, a different relationship than if this vegetation was dry. Um, and in general, because it's in this period where we're trying to track growth, the fact that all of these leaves can catch water and hold water is actually beneficial. So we get a slightly higher correlation coefficient when we use the um, relationships for the wet canopy. Um, but the biggest thing is that this relationship is different. And so this is very important to note. 
So I think just to kind of, you know, this is not just something that happens at a field scale or at a plant scale. We actually observe the same kind of thing in the Amazon. So with the study I showed you, the Amazon earlier, we see this at massive scale. So this is grace equivalent water thickness. Um, this is the dry, the drier season. So in September and November, you see the equivalent water thickness is, uh, is lower. Um, and this means there's a lot of transpiration. And so um, we generally have in the dry periods um, that we're losing water. So the difference between the 10 a.m. data is much higher. The backscatter is higher than at 10 p.m. And we see the opposite. So in the wet season, because the precipitation is always in the afternoon, you see that the backscatter is always higher in the evening than in the morning. And so this presence of surface canopy water is something that's everywhere in, uh, in microwave remote sensing. So the overpass time is critical in all these applications. Um, and it's very relevant for us um, because one of the things that we want to do is really look into the vegetation. So we want to look at vegetation breathing. We want to see transpiration. We want to see when the plant slows down, when it starts to struggle from water stress. And that means looking at the internal water content. So this is some data where you can see um, in terms of the total water amounts, um, most of the water is lost from the stems because they contain most of the water. But if you look in terms of the percentages, the leaves are really super dynamic. So just as a result of transpiration, um, they lose like 2% of their uh, water during the day. And so the vegetation is really dynamic during this time. The internal water content is changing. So as we look at a cycle of backscatter during the day, we have the dew accumulation I've shown you already. But you see here, this is our surface canopy water dropping rapidly. But at the same time, our sap flow is increasing. So our transpiration is increasing. And this results in a drop in backscatter throughout the day. And so we have this incredible cycle during the day of uh, sur the surface canopy water and also the internal water variations. Um, and we have in this, um, in one of our publications, we actually look at different times in the season and look at the combined effect of all of these things. And so if we look over here, you can see there's a relatively small um, uh, dew effect and there's a, a huge sap flow. There's a big, uh, there's a lot of transpiration and you see this decrease in uh, backscatter. And so what we tried to do in this paper was pretty much march through the whole time series and look at when the surface canopy water was dominant and when we could really see internal canopy water. Um, and that's really with a goal of being able to separate these two effects. Um, another example, which is a, a very recent one, is just one of these kind of puzzles that you have. So Nadia Dembeston is doing a PhD at TU Delft and she also works at Fandersat. And they were looking at, um, she was looking at Sentinel-1 data and comparing that to NDVI. And so here I'm showing you that this is the correlation between any of these observables and the yield. And so at the beginning, it's always very close to zero. And then if we look at NDVI, then as the plant grows, if it has a high NDVI, you're probably gonna have a high yield. And this makes sense. This is the intuitive side of why people work with NDVI. And when we looked at Sentinel-1 and specifically the cross ratio, we saw something really confusing, which was that this became anti-correlated. And so we had a period where we were just scratching our heads, trying to wonder why this would be the case. Um, so what we kind of expected was like, you know, well, biomass goes up and then the yield should go up. So this should also be positively correlated. And so if we look at NDVI, this is a very high yield parcel. And you see that the, the NDVI is very high. And then this is a low yield parcel. So the NDVI is always lower than usual. But if we look at the um, Sentinel-1 data, this is our high yield parcel and you see the cross ratio starts to go down. So we were really baffled as to why that would be the case. And so Nadia did um, uh, a study using a model and using a, a data set that she found in the literature. Um, and what she was able to show was that as the sucrose content increases, so as the sugar cane is growing, if you're going to have a high yield, it means you've got a lot of sucrose. And that means that the water is tied into the plant. So we have more bound water than usual. And so the dielectric constant is going down. And so that was why we had this really uh, kind of counterintuitive result. Um, and so this is why when we, just by virtue of the fact that we can observe in a way that we couldn't observe before, we have to constantly look at this physical interpretation because a lot of our kind of basic assumptions are always being questioned. And so we get sometimes very counterintuitive results. So it's important that we keep an eye on the, our physical interpretation and make sure that we can catch up with uh, the data. I want to, so hopefully by now I've convinced you that you can do something uh, useful with uh, radar to monitor vegetation. 
And so the last part of my presentation is I want to encourage you to, uh, if you're new to radar, I want to hopefully provide you with a way of accessing data and playing with it a little bit. Um, this is a project we did with uh, the European Space Agency. Um, we noticed a few years ago that there was a lot of reluctance to take up using SAR for agriculture. So the fact that you can uh, interpret the data and you can see biomass and you can see these closure dates, there was still a reluctance because the data volumes are huge. You need to understand the processing and it's not terribly intuitive. So NDVI is intuitive, but a time series of backscatter is not intuitive for most people. So what we wanted to do was try to make it more accessible. And we did this for the Netherlands because we have a huge amount of open data. Um, so we have uh, in the Netherlands, we have uh, very good parcel boundary data and also the, the crop type is available openly. And so we use this combined with the Sentinel-1 data to produce a spatially tagged uh, database of SAR data. So the idea is that we can take for a given year, instead of having 1.6 terabytes of Sentinel-1 data, that we produce a four gigabyte database and it's indexed by parcel and by location and it, be, it can be queried by administrative boundaries. Um, and so we made this publicly available and we also provide scripts so that people can play with the data a little bit. So it looks something like this. Um, this is the cross ratio that I showed you a few times. This is uh, where we've queried the municipality of Dronton. This is all of the maize fields. So with this database, you can produce the plots that we have in our paper. Um, and you can see the variation across the Netherlands. Um, in the first version, we have a, a sample of the interferometric coherence. And in the next version of the data set, we're also going to include some optical data for comparison. Just to illustrate what you can do with it quickly, um, this is just, we've had three, we've had some very bad uh, droughts in the Netherlands, uh, really multi-year droughts. And this is just, uh, we queried the data. So we pulled out all of the maize data in the flavor folder over three different years. And so what you can see here is um, in the first, if we look at 2018, you can see that the ripening and harvest stage happened earlier. So this decrease in the cross ratio happened much earlier than in 2017. And if you look at the following year, so this is really this compounding uh, drought effect, you see that the seasonal cycle starts a lot later than previous years. And so we're able to demonstrate that with the data. So what we kind of hope is that we've made this data set online um, we've distributed it on uh, 4TU, which is a data repository, so it's open. Um, and what we really hope is that if new users are curious, and so if there's something that you, uh, you think you might be able to see with radar or something that you can't see in optical, um, what we hope is that just this data set makes it a bit easier to experiment with that. So you don't have the burden of... Uh, finding and downloading and processing data, but that you can take a quick look. And also that, uh, yeah, we're also very happy if people reach out to us, if they look at the data and uh, want to work together on the interpretation. And so this is a, a database that um, you're all very welcome to, to use. Um, so to conclude, I think, well, hopefully I've convinced you that microwaves uh, provide us with timely and reliable data. Um, and that the revisit times of Sentinel-1 really allows us to do uh, vegetation monitoring now. Um, the true value of microwaves, I think, is that we're able to look into the vegetation. And so the fact that we have this sensitivity to internal water content means that we have a perspective on the um, health status of the vegetation. So is it behaving normally or is it, um, is it experiencing some kind of stress? Um, I think one of the key things is that um, this isn't all figured out. And so the fact that we have new possibilities and we have new sensors, um, it means that we really have to improve our understanding. So we have to, we can't rely on the models that were developed uh, 20 or 30 years ago. We're able to observe new processes. So we have to make sure that these are, that we can um, characterize or represent these in the models that we're using. Um, and then I think the last thing is really that there's a lot of potential to use radar for agricultural applications. And I think one of the kind of urgent priorities is to um, bring um, the microwave remote sensing community in contact with uh, users. And so that we are not retrieving variables because we can, but that we're really doing it in response to a demand from the community. And one of the ways that we're actively trying to do that is to improve the accessibility. And so I'd encourage you to, uh, take a look at our data set and see if there's uh, something interesting in there for you. Um, just because I know that the slides are going to go online, um, I put all of the references here so that you can um, 
look up any of the details of any of the slides that I flew through very quickly. And also this provides me a very nice way to thank uh, all of the people in my group and my collaborators for their uh, contributions to the results I presented today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, I see clapping hands. And while people gear up for questions, I um, exploit the moderator role and ask um, two, one broad one and the more specific one. Um, we have uh, a project that um, covers the study area in the Amazon that you showed us uh, in the beginning. Um, and uh, so one of the game-changing remote sensing innovations in, in Brazil was um, the modus-based uh, almost real-time deforestation monitoring tool. The yeah. problem of that um, until now actually is that it can't see through clouds. Um, so I was wondering um, how, how long do you think it takes until um, it, you can set up a, a real-time forest monitoring system based on, on radar? That, that's the first one. Um, Maybe I leave it to that, and if I have time in the end, I ask the second one. Um, so that one is relatively straightforward. So I think um, at the moment, I mentioned, well, actually, you mentioned this Minerva network. Um, within our Minerva network, our colleagues at Wageningen University work quite a lot on uh, detecting deforestation. And so they're definitely moving towards real time. Uh, one of the limitations at the moment is the revisit time of Sentinel-1. Um, and the revisit time of other um, SAR satellites. And so if we have Sentinel-1 data, then the cloud problem is gone. Um, and so the, the constraint is really the revisit time, um, but there are also commercial providers. So at the moment, uh, Capella Space are building up a constellation of SAR satellites. Um, also ISI have a, are building a constellation. And so one of, the, um, one of the things that I suspect is going to happen relatively quickly is that there's, there will be a move towards really doing this in real time. And then resolution is uh, as high or higher as Landsat or? or... Um, I think it's, it would be on the order of tens of meters. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I would have to check uh, their processing, but as far as I know, I think it's on the order of tens of meters. Okay. Colleagues, I see one hand um, by Javier. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Great. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. It was um, very, very interesting, especially for me. I've been working with um, trying to map uh, grassland biomass with radar with Sentinel One, and I was a bit disappointed because I could never. It was difficult to find um, uh, patterns that I could relate to 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 biomass or species. Um, I've seen that uh, well, Netherlands is quite uh, convenient. Uh, site to to research very flat and very homogeneous uh, precipitation patterns do you mm -hmm. think you could um, replicate the results you've had in areas where there's uh, more relief for example different slopes different aspects different precipitation levels um yeah so one of the reasons why i think the netherlands is a good playground for testing anything is that we have a sort of monoculture agriculture so all of our fields are nicely regular shapes and a single crop and we know what's in the field um, i think when you look at um, if you look at more heterogeneous agriculture so where you have mixed crop um, things become more challenging um, definitely in terms of uh, radar variations in relief are uh, we have two things. So one of them is you have things that are static and things that change over time. And I think if you can separate those two, um, I think it helps. Um, and one of the other things would be there's a lot of uh, a lot of people classify on you know one image at a time. Um, and there's a lot to be said for looking at the variation over time. So instead of using a single sentinel one imagery, but to really choose times where you expect a difference between the crops. Um, and so to some extent, you could test that in, uh, you know, in the Netherlands, you could clearly see a difference between the, the seasonal cycle of maize and potatoes or wheat. Um, the challenge really comes when you have uh, cropping patterns that are so heterogeneous. So we've looked at, um, we looked at trying to, uh, if you try to detect irrigated areas in uh, Africa, for example, 
where the parcels are very small, so they get to be comparable to the resolution of Sentinel-1. They have irregular shapes, and also you have rows of crops uh, mixed together. And so then I think it's obviously going to be difficult to classify, but then the question is, well, what are you really trying to figure out? Because beyond knowing that that's agriculture, um, it's not like you're going to know that you know one strip of it is uh, watermelons and the other strip is something else. Um, and so I, I think one thing is to be very realistic about the, the resolution of the, um, the data and the assumptions that you're making. So if you're going to try to classify something with 10 meter resolution, it should be homogeneous at that scale. Um, and then I think in terms of doing it in more complicated landscapes, um, it is true that you know terrain has an effect, but the terrain doesn't change that dramatically. Um, and also for the precipitation, I think, uh, you know, you have soil moisture variations, um, but you can also look at how much they vary in space. But I, I think for any classification problem, I think we tend to look at, you know, when are these things going to be distinguishable and then try to um, put in a, a data set that will allow us to tell them apart. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Thank um, you very much. I Alicia is next on my list. Susan, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, at the beginning, you also mentioned that this microwaves can be used for uh, ecological monitoring. I was wondering, particularly if you can give some idea if mic microwaves can be used for monitoring for carbon, carbon both in the vegetation and also carbon in the soil. Uh, can microwaves go through the vegetation and see the carbon uh, dynamics in the soil? Thank you. Um, yeah, so actually, this is a conversation we've had a couple of times with uh, different colleagues uh, recently, even. Um, the first thing for carbon in the vegetation, I think there's potentially a huge role, and that's because the water and carbon cycles are so tightly coupled. And so when we observe uh, water dynamics and when we observe changes in transpiration and changes in the, how the vegetation is breathing, it's very tightly connected to uh, carbon. Um, one of the big applications of uh, microwave remote sensing, both the uh, passive and also the um, passive and active, even the coarse resolution, is in the estimation of above ground biomass. And so there are a lot of a lot of people doing that already. Um, there's also a radar mission coming up called Biomass, which is intended to uh, provide uh, global maps of the carbon stocks. Um, but I'm guessing that you mean more the dynamic side of things. And so that side of it is really where um, I think what we're doing becomes relevant. And so looking at ecosystem stress, um, looking at how the ecosystem is responding to a drought. And then I think, you know, it's not a, we're not observing carbon directly, but we're observing processes that are related to the carbon processes. Um, in terms of soil, so what I know from colleagues is that um, when, they, if, when they try to estimate the uh, carbon, people use a lot of uh, reflectance data. Um, and microwave, as I mentioned, we're really measuring the dielectric constant. And so we're not going to measure carbon directly. Um, but one of the areas where it's potentially relevant is in the role that soil moisture has on uh, the carbon content and on the carbon uh, changes in the carbon content. Um, in terms of SAR, I think one of the big opportunities is in uh, tillage and so tillage detection. So I, I showed examples where we're able to detect um, harvest. And this is basically um, some sort of a change or a disruption in the scene. Um, and one of the other things that we're looking at now, in addition to harvest, is to see if we can detect tillage. Um, and for us, it's kind of interesting because we have models that don't account for agricultural management practices. So we want to include that. Um, but a big part of it is also to understand the effect that tillage is uh, that it has on the um, carbon in the soil. So I think there are different, regardless of the scale or the context, I think there's a, there are lots of opportunities with uh, microwaves, even though it's very indirect. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, are there other questions? Not I'll threaten to chip in another Amazon question. Um, okay, then I'll do that. Um, in this project that I mentioned, um, we are trying to, so we're collecting data actually in the field on, on crop yields and, and, and crop income from crop production, all that. But we're trying to relate that to the spatial configuration of forests and secondary vegetation around those 
um, uh, crop fields. And uh, one hypothesis is that there are, um, you know, effects um, of uh, positive and negative effects of having forest and secondary vegetation around. One positive could be through hydrological um, benefits, um, higher air moisture or higher um, soil moisture, whatever. Um, is there a way to actually um, look at that with, with um, microwave remote sensing and, and, and try to see whether, you know, uh, moisture retention or moisture content in fields that are closer to, to forest or secondary forest remnants um, um, is somehow different from fields that are more homogeneously in, in agricultural landscapes? Um, I think so. So one of the things that you I mentioned this whole actionable information and the need to talk to to users. Um, a lot of the times, I think what we're looking at are basically signatures of things on the surface. Um, and I think if you can form a hypothesis, like you expect that a certain um, uh, a certain intervention has uh, an impact on soil moisture. I think you, you can retrieve soil moisture and then test that hypothesis. Um, and a lot of it is about formulating the question in a way that you can test it with, uh, with remote sensing data. Um, and we have this quite a bit. So I mentioned this um, irrigation project. You know, we weren't, we had real trouble distinguishing between uh, natural vegetation and irrigated, irrigated uh, vegetation. And the reason is very simple was that the natural vegetation had sort of evolved to handle the lack of water and the um, irrigated agriculture was surviving because it was being irrigated. And when we look at the data, if you do a classification, they look exactly the same. But if you look at it over time, you can see a difference where the agricultural area is irrigated or not irrigated because you look at the soil moisture and you see the soil moisture effect. Um, and so a lot of it is that it's not like you do a classification and it's black and white. But there's a certain amount of interpretation of it. Does it make sense that the soil moisture would be higher or not? Um, and so I, I think for a lot of these things, it's a matter of formulating the question in a way that you can exploit the, the data that you have at hand. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Colleagues, any other question? I'm looking into the chat. No hands up. There's one. Um, Jan. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Susan. I was just wondering, you have um, shown results from, or you have shown that uh, different incidence angles um, provide different types of information or yeah, different types mm. of information. Um, but also different frequencies will provide different information. Um, yeah. Is there, as far as I know, there, there isn't any sensor or satellite that combines uh, measurements of different uh, microwave frequencies. Is that correct? Yeah, so the, the reason for this is it's quite tricky. Um, if you look at, um, AMSER has quite a few frequencies. So that's a radiometer that has uh, different frequencies and also the SIMR mission that's uh, planned that also has multiple frequencies. Um, but the, the limitation in doing that is that you need to have different antennas usually. Mm -hmm. um, and when you span a, a large range of uh, frequencies, then you, it's very, it becomes very difficult to do that with a single antenna. Um, and so in passive microwave uh, radiometry, there are missions that have multiple frequencies. Um, the incidence angle is not so much that uh, when, if we were to look uh, straight down, then we have a very high sensitivity to soil moisture. And when we look at an angle, we have a longer pass through vegetation and we lose sensitivity to the soil moisture. What we're trying to do with the ASCAT um, data set is actually exploit the fact that we have observations at different incidence angles. And so we look at this, uh, the incidence angle behavior as an indication of what the vegetation is doing. And so what we're trying to do is interpret that. Um, so they're, they're two kind of different things, but there is a reason why it's, uh, it's difficult to have multiple frequencies. Yeah. So most, uh, most SAR missions would have uh, one frequency. Um, NISAR is coming up and that will have S and L band. Um, and so S band is, uh, kind of theoretically it should be more sensitive to vegetation whereas l band will see through the vegetation to the soil and the idea is that it would allow you to disentangle them mm. okay yeah okay thanks 
Jürgen. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, since uh, Elbant is obviously an issue, um, I mean, there is an Elbant signal of opportunity, which is the reflected signal from all the GNSS satellites. Mm -hmm. Is that, and I know that people have looked at that in the past, but is that something that you think, I mean, with the growing number of different GNSS systems that should be explored more? Um, this is actually a very active uh, research topic at the moment, so it is one of those uh, signals of opportunity. Um, I think the thing that's interesting about it is that it combines, it provides you with very continuous data. Um, and so you would have sub daily uh, observations if you can aggregate them. Um, and a lot of the, um, I think a lot of the lessons that we've learned in the field with a, a ground based L band scatterometer in terms of understanding what we're looking at, I think a lot of those are very applicable to GNSS. But this is definitely one of the emerging, uh, I think this is one of the emerging techniques in our field. Yeah. Okay, any other question? Doesn't seem to be the case, which is fine. Um, if there are no further questions, I'd like to thank you all for joining and a special thanks to Susan for the great talk. Um, I, I think I do have a couple of follow-up questions, so expect an email from me um, because I, I really want to look into this um, uh, moisture thing. Um, but maybe when we have our data collected, um, we'll we'll drop your message and then we can discuss yeah. that further if you're interested. Definitely, yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, have a great rest of the week and uh, see you on another occasion. <laughs>